Oh, so shall we? Yeah. So we start now? Yeah, we can start. Yeah, okay. So okay. it's uh, uh, our pleasure <clears throat> to have Jamin Park from University of Barcelona, who is going to talk about the existence of non trivial stationary solution for 2D and compressible Euler. Okay, uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the organizer again for the invitation. Uh, today, uh, I'd like to talk about the stationary solutions to the 2D Euler equation. Uh, so the main result is very simple to state. Uh, we are able to construct some non-radial, uh, non-trivial uh, stationary solutions. Uh, of course, uh, during the talk, I'm going to specify what I mean by trivial solutions. And the solutions that we constructed, uh, they have some interesting uh, features as well. So I hope some of the audience find the results interesting. Uh, most importantly, uh, this is a joint work uh, with Javi, uh, Javier Gomez Serrano uh, at uh, University of Barcelona and Jia uh, Jiasu uh, at Princeton University and uh, Yao Yao at the National University of Singapore. So uh, let me just quickly go over some basics about the 2D Euler uh, equation. So uh, we consider the incompressible Euler equation uh, in two dimensions. Uh, the equation boils down to a very simple uh, transport equation. Here, the omega is a scalar valid function that denotes uh, vorticity, and it's transported by a velocity field u. But at the same time, u is uh, the velocity is determined by the vorticity itself uh, by using uh, what is called Biot-Savall law. Okay, and of course, we consider uh, initial data. So. Uh, we consider this equation in uh, R2, the whole plane without boundary. Uh, in this case, we can write this inverse Laplacian as a convolution with the Newtonian potential, uh, which is denoted by curly n, uh, just a logarithmic function uh, divided by two pi. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, it's a very classical object in fluid dynamics uh, and there are several like, different notions of solutions, but today uh, I like to just focus on a special type of solution that is called a vertex patch. Uh, so for vertex patch, you just imagine that your initial uh, initial uh, vorticity is a characteristic function uh, defined on a certain bounded domain D. And then the equation is transport the equation. So you can imagine that the solution at time T is just given as a push forward of the initial data, the push forward by the, the flow map uh, generated by the velocity field. So um, the solution at time t uh, still uh, stays as a characteristic function. So what changes in time is just the, the shape of your domain. Okay. And instead of thinking of this one single uh, characteristic function, you can slightly more generally, you can think of just a linear combination of uh, these characteristic functions, as you can see. So namely, you have uh, some several uh, multiple uh, disconnected domains and you, you assign different vorticity values on each of them, uh, as you can see in the figure. So then uh, what are the stationary solutions? So literally the stationary solutions are like the solutions that do not uh, depend on time. So there are several uh, stationary solutions that you can think of. Uh, one can think of uh, uh, show flow, for example, but when you, when you think about shear flow, uh, the, the vorticity uh, does not have a compact support. It, it's supported everywhere, but if we are, consider, we are considering this equation in the whole plane, so it's less physically relevant in this case. And also you can think of uh, hyperbolic flow whose vorticity is just zero everywhere. So for those vorticity whose support is compact or it decays at infinity sufficiently fast, you can consider the radial vorticity. So if you have a radial vorticity, then uh, it generates a circular flow and the equation is transport. So this circular flow will rotate your vorticity, but uh, the vorticity is always radial. So it doesn't really change the shape and uh, you can easily see that such uh, vorticity is stationary. Okay. So for the vertex patch case, uh, so what one can notice is that uh, if a vertex patch is stationary solution, then the velocity vector, normal velocity vector on the boundary has to be zero. Uh, so <clears throat> if uh, the normal velocity vector is not zero on the boundary, then it means that uh, the boundary, uh, it changes, its shape changes instantaneously. So obviously 
uh, it is not uh, stationary anymore. Okay. So at the moment, uh, we know that any radial vorticity uh, is a stationary solution. And then a very natural question that one can ask is the, the converse implication, whether a stationary solution uh, with compact supports has to be a radial function or not. So uh, for a simply connected patch case, there's a positive answer uh, given by Frankel. So he proved that assuming that the patch is uh, simply connected, then such a stationary solution has to be a disk. So it's radially symmetric. There's uh, another uh, interesting result obtained by Hamel and Nadirashvili. Uh, they proved that if you have a stationary solution uh, that doesn't have a stagnation point. So here the stagnation point means that a point on R2 where the velocity field vanishes. So if there's no stagnation point, then such a stationary solution has to be a uh, shift. Okay. So these two results doesn't make a contradiction because if you have a vertex patch, then uh, there must be at least one uh, stagnation point inside the patch. So it doesn't really have to be the shift flow. Uh, so uh, just a few years, a few years ago, we obtained a slightly more general results compared to this uh, simply connected patch case. So we consider uh, a linear combination of vertex patches, assuming that each vorticity is non-negative. So we assign and sign condition. Then uh, we prove that such a stationary solution has to be uh, radially symmetric. So the only possible case is that you have just a bunch of annuli, concentric annuli, and possibly there's one single disk at the center. Uh, but uh, here, uh, one can ask whether the sign condition is really necessary. So here, the, whether, whether the vorticity is non-negative or non-positive, that doesn't really matter. What the point is whether the vorticity has to have a fixed sign or not. So we want to uh, see whether allowing uh, the vorticity to change sign, uh, we can construct a non-radial uh, stationary solution. So it's about this like non-trivial the construction of the non-trivial uh, station solutions. Uh, here I brought some uh, relevant uh, the works uh, on, in, on in this direction. So uh, first of all, uh, in two-dimensional torus, uh, it was proved that there are actually a lot of uh, stationary solutions obtained by Chofrut and Beklehidi. What they proved is that. If you are given a stationary solution, say like shear flow in, in, in torus, then around near this given stationary solution, we can construct infinitely many uh, stationary weak solutions. But those solutions are obtained by uh, this convex integral scheme and they are very irregular. But for some special type of uh, shear flows like homograph flow, uh, it was obtained by Kutuzalati and Ergindi and uh, our first speaker, Klaus. Uh, they prove that there are more regular non-trivial uh, stationary solutions. And also uh, it's been considered, uh, uh, this like, flexibility uh, result was considered by Konstantin Drivas and Ginsburg here. I'm using this term of flexibility uh, to refer to uh, in the sense that whether this uh, condition that the, station, that the solution is stationary is flexible in the sense that it allows the solution to have some more uh, complicated uh, geometric structure. Okay. But uh, today, uh, as I said, we want to focus on the, uh, the R2 case. So in R2, actually one can construct a smooth uh, non-radial uh, stationary solution, uh, but uh, it was constructed by Musso, Picard, and Wei. Uh, they actually constructed such a stationary solution so that its kinetic energy is finite. Here, the kinetic energy is just L2 of the, the velocity vector. So the velocity vector, it decays uh, quite fast at infinity. So the vorticity, it decays uh, fast at infinity as well. Uh, but it doesn't seem to, uh, to me that uh, the vorticity doesn't seem to have a compact support in their case. And lately, uh, the David Ruiz, uh, he announced that uh, he, was able to uh, construct a station, non-trivial stationary solution in R2, uh, whose velocity vector is also compactly supported. But the solution that he constructed is not uh, smooth, but it's 
uh, barely contained in C1. So it's C alpha for any alpha less than one, but it's not really contained in C1 case. And uh, our main uh, results uh, are, uh, can be summarized in these two theorems. So namely, we were able to construct uh, non-radial stationary patch solutions, and we could do it uh, for, uh, for infinite kinetic energy case and the finite energy case. So, but, but for the finite kinetic energy case, uh, we uh, obtained slightly more uh, stronger results uh, that is about this compact support of the velocity field. So if you have a vertex patch, then it's easy to show that the, the velocity vector is at least continuous. So if you have a compact support of the velocity, then uh, this kinetic energy is obviously finite. So, uh, so today, I, so, uh, between these two results, I like to focus on the finite energy case because uh, the infinite energy case uh, actually can be done in quite like standard way. Uh, and also these finite kinetic energy solutions, they have more interesting features. And before uh, going to the, uh, the details of the proof, uh, I like to mention that actually for the finite energy case, there's a much uh, easier and more clever construction, which I will describe right now. So uh, one easy fact uh, is that uh, this finite kinetic energy is equivalent to the zero average of the vertices. Okay. So what one can do is that you consider a radial vorticity, uh, which uh, consists of the two layers, as you can see on the left-hand side. And then we assign a positive vorticity on the outer layer. And then we are going to put some negative vorticity in the inner domain. And then you can choose this uh, inner vorticity so that the average of the vorticity to be zero. Then uh, of course, this is a radial function, so this is stationary. But what you can see is that for such theta, when the vorticity average becomes zero, then the velocity vector, it vanishes in the uh, this exterior domain. The velocity vector, its support is exactly equal to the support of the vorticity. Okay? Uh, once we have this, then what uh, one can do is that you just make a superposition of this, uh, such vorticity as you can see on the right hand side, then uh, the velocity vector uh, generated by say this uh, vorticity, it leaves only the support of this component. So it doesn't make a contribution to the evolution of the others. So each of them is stationary and they don't interact each other. So this whole uh, configuration still defines a stationary solution and of course, each connected component is radially symmetric, but once you put them all together in the one same plane, then technically speaking, uh, this is not radially symmetric anymore. But still we think that at least locally, such a solution has a trivial structure. So we wanted to find something uh, more non-trivial. So uh, <clears throat> here's uh, some like qualitative uh, figure of the the solutions that we constructed here. So we consider uh, two layer vorticity. We are going to put some positive vorticity in the inner domain, and we are going to put some negative vorticity in the outer domain. And as you can see, the, when you look at the velocity field, as you approach to the outermost boundary, it gets weaker and weaker, and it vanishes on every point on the boundary, and it becomes completely zero in the exterior domain. Of course, we constructed this solution in R2, but obviously this can be thought of as a stationary solution in any domain as you want, because it doesn't have a interaction with the boundary. Uh, another uh, feature uh, of this solution that I want to mention is about the stagnation points. So here, uh, so basically the, the stagnate, or a stagnation point is a critical point of the stream function and especially when the critical point is a set of points, then it's very hard to imagine what the streamlines look like. Uh, so here I brought some uh, figures from Miles Wheeler's web page. So these uh, figures are rotating vertex patches. So uh, each of them under the, uh, the Euler equation evolution, they don't change the shape, but they just rotate with a 
fixed constant angular rotational speed. So of course, these solutions are not really stationary solutions, but if you think of the solutions in the rotating frame, then they look stationary, right? And here, this black little dots, they are the stagnation points in the rotating frame. So it turns out that as long as a stagnation point is away from the boundary, then the boundary of the patch is analytic. It's very smooth. But once a stagnation point is located on the boundary, then the, the boundary regularity breaks down and it's numerically observed that there is a corner development and the corner is always 90 degree angle. Okay. The similar uh, phenomenon can be observed in the water wave case uh, if you consider the 2D water waves. Uh, instead of looking for rotating solutions, you can think of a traveling wave solutions. Then uh, it's, uh, it's also observed that if you have a stagnation point on the surface, then uh, there's a corner development uh, and the angle of the corner is only 120 degree, which is called a step soft conjecture. So it seems that if you have a stagnation point on the boundary, then there's like some, the regularity is not uh, guaranteed to be uh, smooth, but in our case, uh, every single point on the outermost boundary is a stagnation point. But the difference is that our stagnation points are not discrete. So somehow it helps the, the, the solution to maintain the regularity. And then we were actually able to prove that the boundary is uh, analytic. Um, so uh, from now on, I like to uh, <clears throat> get to more details about the proof. So before that, uh, let me just explain some uh, notations uh, of, and uh, the problem setting. So as I mentioned, we are going to consider two layer uh, vorticity and we have uh, some positive vorticity, which is denoted by A and this will be chosen later. And then we assume that we have a negative vorticity in the outer domain, uh, say negative one. And then we look for a non-radial station solutions, but uh, just, but the solutions that are close to the radial one. So we are going to assume that the patches, uh, each domain is uh, uh, star shaped. So the boundary, each boundary can be uh, parameterized by like in a very usual way in the polar, a polar coordinate system. So for example, the distance between the boundary and the origin uh, can be just expressed as a function of the angle theta. Uh, and uh, so here like this, uh, so of course, if R1, R2, R0, then you get just radial vorticity. So we want to, uh, uh, so, so as I mentioned, we are looking for solutions that are close to uh, the radial ones. So we are going to assume that the R1 and R2 are small. So here these specific numbers one and two, and they are just like random numbers that I pick, but just we want to guarantee that the two boundaries, they don't uh, touch each other. And also we use this uh, very conventional notations N1 and N2 to denote the, the normal vectors on the boundary. Okay. Uh, so uh, obviously if you fix this pair, just, uh, the inner vorticity A and the boundary R, so here uh, this R is a pair of R and R2 that parameterizes the each of the boundaries. So this pair, it completely determines the vorticity. So once you have the vorticity, then you can think of this, uh, the, the velocity field and the stream functions as well. So we can think of those objects as functions of just A and R. Okay. So then now our goal is to choose this inner vorticity and these uh, boundary uh, parameterizations. So we look for these boundaries in the Sobolev spaces at HK. So K could be like any large number as you want. So uh, we want to find this pair uh, that solves the following functional equation. So if you are given uh, this A and R, then the image of the functional is just the normal velocity uh, on, each, uh, on, on, on each boundary. So, uh, so the first uh, component on the top, it, it concerns the, the normal velocity on the outer boundary and second component, it concerns the inner boundary uh, normal velocity vector. Uh, so of course, if we can find this A and R, then it defines a stationary solution because 
as we saw before, if you don't have any like normal velocity vector on the boundary, then it doesn't change the shape of your patch and it stays stationary. Uh, one easy fact that we can observe here is that uh, because we already know that any radial vorticity is stationary. So if R is zero, then for any uh, value A, uh, it, uh, it solves this functional equation. So uh, from now on, I'm going to call this uh, number uh, constant a, uh, just uh, the parameter, and I'm going to call this r uh, functional uh, argument. So we set up this functional, and then uh, <clears throat> we want to find the non trivial solution. So basically, uh, we want to use uh, what is called Cranda Rabinovich theorem. So uh, the Cranda Rabinovich theorem, it tells you that. If you have a functional that satisfies uh, some conditions, then uh, there is a curve and the, the each point on the curve corresponds to this pair of the parameter and the functional arguments that solves the this functional equation. And the solution is non-trivial. So what one can do is to check whether the functional that we constructed in the previous slide satisfies all these conditions. So if so, then the proof is done. But the problem is that uh, our functional doesn't really satisfy these conditions. So we have to uh, go over the original proof of the current Rabin a bit and see where the proof breaks down. And then uh, we check uh, whether this problem can be fixed or not. So uh, for that purpose, I like to take a more a closer look uh, at the structure of this current Rabin theorem. So the current Rabin theorem basically. Uh, is the following. So you have a functional that defines, uh, that depends on a parameter and a functional argument. Uh, R lives in some Hilbert space and uh, its image is in another Hilbert space YC. And uh, there are three conditions. Uh, so the first one is that if uh, R is zero, then F equals to zero for any parameter. Okay, so, and this certainly can be satisfied by our functional as well, as I mentioned before. And then we look at the linearized operator of this functional uh, on these trivial solutions, okay? <clears throat> so, so here the linearized operator, uh, what I mean is the, the, the derivative with respect to this variable r in the direction space x. So if this uh, linearized operator is an isomorphism, then the usual implicit function theorem says that there near that point, there exists only one unique solution curve. There's only one level set, but we want to find a non-trivial solution curve. So we shouldn't expect to have an isomorphism. And the second condition says that there exists a certain uh, parameter A star, such that this linearized operator is not an isomorphism, but it's kernel and image perp so the, the orthogonal complement of the, the image space. So they are one dimension, okay? So here the specific number one doesn't really matter. That's because we are looking for a bifurcation curve, which is one dimensional object. But if we had like two or three higher dimensional uh, kernel and image spaces, then we are expecting to have like higher dimensional like bifurcation plane or higher dimensional objects. <clears throat> but let's stick to just the one here. And there's another condition that is called a transfer solid condition. And this one, uh, at least to me, is the most complicated one uh, compared to the other two. So let me uh, save words right at the moment, but I will get back to uh, this point uh, in a minute. So as I mentioned, then let's see how these three conditions can give us uh, non-trivial solutions. So the key ingredients of the, uh, the current Robin of theorem proof is what is called Lyapunov-Schmidt reduction. So here the Lyapunov-Schmidt reduction is a technique uh, by which you can reduce a infinite dimensional problem into a finite dimensional problem. So certainly the, the initial problem is uh, the functional equation defined on this Hilbert space, which is infinite dimensional. But this Lyapunov-Schmidt reduction uh, says that if the second condition is satisfied. It's one dimensional, uh, the kernel and the image perp. Then uh, there exists some function uh, phi defined on 
R2 such that uh, phi equals to zero at the origin. And if we can find a point that is not equal to the origin, but where uh, phi becomes zero. So if we can find a non-trivial solution to phi, then there exists a non-trivial solution to the this original problem. So instead of looking for the non-trivial solution for f, which is defined in this infinite dimensional space, all, all we have to do is to find a non-trivial solution for phi, which is defined the finite dimension. Uh, and then what can we, how can we find uh, the non-trivial solution for phi? So the, the easiest way is to look at the gradients of phi at the origin, because we already know the phi equals to zero at the origin. And if the gradient doesn't vanish at this point, then the usual implicit function theorem says that the zero level set of phi is not just one single point, but it's a curve. So it automatically gives you a non-trivial solution. So uh, this uh, transversality condition that I skipped to explain, that is just a necessary condition for uh, phi to have a non-vanishing uh, gradient at the origin. So uh, with, this, with uh, these three conditions, uh, that's how the kind of Rabinov theorem uh, gives you uh, non-trivial solutions. So, Excuse uh, me. Yes. Uh, may I have a question? Uh, yes. What's the relationship between this phi and this capital F? Uh, phi and capital F. Yeah. So um, basically, uh, so here we have this like one dimensional kernel and the image perfect spaces, right? So we yes. project the domain and the image spaces. Uh, we just subtract this like one dimensional spaces so that the functional can be defined like as a, a like the uh, so like we, we subtract this like one dimension is like corner and the image perp so that the function whose uh, derivative whose linearized operator can be thought of as an isomorphism and B and B and F uh, B and F the relationship uh, I, I'm I'm sorry. So right at the moment, I can't really think of a good explanation. Or maybe I can ask for an, uh, yes. in a different way. So yes. Uh, so so how if for example you want to check this uh, existence of this f, then uh, then how 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 do you design this phi this function phi or what yes. kind of function do you want to check for this phi? I mean, what uh, kind of function do I want to check? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you want to make sure that this phi has two zero, uh, uh, at zero is zero and uh, has some other point which is non zero, uh, which is non zero also satisfy phi xy equals zero. So, I mean, what kind of property? You, uh, yes. If you translate this this information to f, then what what kind of information this f should satisfy? I mean, uh, uh, in order to have such phi, then what uh, conditions yeah. do we have to impose on f? So that's basically yeah, yeah. this uh, the second condition, like one dimensional uh, spaces of the linearized operator, like the kernel and the image. Perfect. They have to be uh, one dimensional. Uh, Okay, so D is a is a, a gradient of of F, yes, right? uh, the gradient, uh, the derivative. Okay, uh -huh. with respect to R, the variable R. But so so phi is not the gradient of F, no, 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 no not 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 really. They okay. are not really equal. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you for uh, asking a question. So mm -hmm. then, uh, as I mentioned. Uh, let me continue. Uh, so we want to apply this theorem to our uh, case. And uh, of course, we have to analyze uh, this uh, linearized operator of our functional uh, determined by uh, at least like trivial solutions. Okay. So for this purpose, uh, uh, let's uh, look at the linearized operator. So here, this the configuration is the same as the one that you saw 
in previous slide, uh, but I just brought it in case you forget some notations. But I'm going to use another notation. So we are going to uh, use this psi to denote the, uh, the stream function determined by uh, this vorticity. And then by using this sub uh, script R and theta, uh, they are denoting this radial derivative and the angular derivative. Of course, these uh, they are functions in R2, but uh, we like time to time restrict these uh, functions on the boundary because we only need the information on the boundary. Okay. So then let's recall that the functional, if we take one, uh, the inner vorticity and the boundary lives in HK, then the image uh, is HK minus one. So we lose one derivative. The reason is the following. So the image of F is just normal velocity uh, on each boundary. So basically we have this normal vector and the normal vector is just the rotation of the tangential vector, but the tangential vector is just a derivative of your uh, parameterization. So we take one derivative. So the image has to be one less regular than the input. Uh, slightly more uh, explicitly, the functional image can be expressed in this way. Uh, that's uh, very simple to see. So we have this uh, stream function determined by this vorticity. And then we restrict this psi on each boundary, say outer uh, boundary. Then we just compose this psi with the, uh, this parameterization. And then we look at the, uh, the tangential derivative of the psi. So you can just do elementary chain rule, then you get the expressions that you can see on the right hand side. Okay. But uh, the, the, the important part is that, uh, so the image, so if the R, if the input is HK regular, the, then as I mentioned, the image is HK minus one regular. Actually, that's only because of these parts, we have this derivative uh, with respect to the variable theta, but the gradient of psi doesn't really lose the derivative. So it's a well-known fact that if you have a vertical patch and then you look at the velocity field, then the velocity is uh, actually smooth inside the patch, but it's as smooth as the boundary up to the boundary. So if you restrict the gradient of stream function on the boundary, then uh, it is as regular as the boundary. So this uh, loss of derivative, it's so, it solely de depends on uh, these two terms. Okay. And then, uh, as I mentioned, we look at the, uh, the linearized operator, we simply uh, take a derivative with respect to the variable r, and then we perturb the uh, each boundary by h. Then, if the derivative hits this guy or this guy, then we can simply uh, replace them by h, as you can see here. But if the derivative hits like psi, the gradient of psi, then you are going to have like much more complicated expressions. But the explicit expression doesn't really matter at this moment. So let's put the other term just as an operator k. And as I mentioned, uh, this gradient of psi, it is as smooth as the boundary. So we can expect that the linearized, uh, of the linear operator k, it preserves the regularity. So if your boundary is hk regular, then the, its image is also a, uh, in hk. So we know how, what the linearized operator looks like at this moment, and let's see uh, how we can apply this to uh, our case. So as I mentioned, we look at the linearized operator determined by the trivial solution, so the red ones. Okay. So we are going to look at the linearized operator determined by this radial vorticity. Then uh, first, uh, so we consider this uh, finite energy case, and then we fix this parameter, the inner vorticity, to guarantee that the average of the vorticity uh, becomes zero. And then uh, one can easily see that the, the radial derivative of the stream function uh, on the inner boundary, it has to be a strictly positive constant. That's because the stream function, it's Laplacian is vorticity. So in the inner domain, uh, the stream function is subharmonic function. And just you can use the maximum principle to show that the, the normal derivative doesn't vanish. It has to be a strictly positive number. But when you look at the outer boundary, 
uh, as I as I when I as I explained when we make this superposition of uh, uh, superposition of uh, trivial solutions, uh, the, the velocity vector determined by this trivial one it vanishes on the exterior domain. So uh, on the outer boundary, the psi r has to be zero. Okay. Then uh, we plug this information into our uh, linearized operator. So as we saw in the previous slide, the linearized operator uh, looks like this. And the K is a linear map between two uh, same regularity spaces. But uh, just to make our life easier, I'm, I just want to pretend that this operator K is a Hilbert transform. Then uh, when you look at the uh, linearized operator uh, in the direction H1 and H2, then on the outer boundary, we know that this psi R is just zero, so there's nothing, but there's only one single term coming from this operator k, which is uh, being assumed as a Hilbert transform. So we have this Hilbert transform of H1. But when you look at this, uh, this expression on the inner boundary, then you have some positive, strictly positive constant here, and uh, you have another Hilbert transform acting on H2. Okay? So we want to see whether this one can have one dimensional kernel and the image perp space. So let's look at this operator in the Fourier side. So you just, you can use uh, the symbols uh, and then the Hilbert space, uh, its symbol is just a sign of the frequency. And this d theta becomes uh, the frequency times the imaginary, imaginary number i. So then the question is, whether you can fix this parameter A so that this infinite number of matrix matrices can have exactly one dimensional kernel and the image perp space. Uh, that's possible because uh, actually this, this parameter A can modulate this constant C in because it's uh, the psi, as I mentioned, it's subharmonic function if you increase uh, the Laplacian then it's normal uh, velocity vector, uh, it changes as well. So for example, if you, model, if you choose right parameter A, so that C in to be say one third, then you can see this matrix uh, has exactly one dimensional kernel and image perp when only when n equals to three. But for all the other ends of the matrices are like just uh, isomorphism. Okay. But the problem, uh, happens uh, at this moment. So this uh, operator can have one dimensional kernel and prop space, uh, but uh, between two, these two spaces. So the point is the, the outer boundary. So because the all we have uh, on the, the first component is just a Hilbert transform. So it doesn't lose the derivative, but when you look at the original nonlinear problem, the, the, the nonlinear functional, that we must have one uh, regularity. But the problem is that HK space is compactly embedded into HK minus one. So the image perp uh, in this space cannot be a finite dimensional space. So the image perp has to be an uh, infinite dimensional space. So basically what it tells you is that we cannot guarantee the second condition of the current probability theorem and we cannot use the left of treatment reduction anymore. Okay. So this uh, so every like, this problem is actually because of this the degeneracy of the velocity, the velocity uh, field on the outer boundary. But at the same time, uh, it gives us some hint that we uh, maybe uh, able to obtain something stronger. It's about the compact support of the velocity field. Okay. So let's suppose we have already found this, uh, some A star and R star that defines a stationary uh, solutions with finite kinetic energy. Of course, this is the one that we have to find, but let's suppose we already found one. And then let's see how uh, the, the stream function looks like. So we look at the stream function in the exterior domain, just the, the complement of the support of the vorticity. So obviously the Laplacian of the stream function is the vorticity, which has to be zero 
in this external domain because there's no vorticity. And we are assuming that uh, this vorticity defines a stationary solution. So the string function has to be a constant on this uh, boundary, the outer boundary. Okay? Then the classical maximum principle tells you that the maximum or the minimum of this uh, harmonic function has to be attained on the boundary or uh, at infinity. So the typical example could be just a logarithmic function. This is harmonic in the exterior domain, but its maximum is attained at infinity. Right? But we have an additional uh, condition, uh, which is uh, the Laplacian of psi, which is the vorticity, its average is zero. So it prevents uh, it prevents psi uh, from having its maximum and minimum uh, at the infinity. So its maximum and minimum has to be attained on the boundary. But because we are assuming the solution is stationary, that means the psi has to be constant in, at every point on the boundary. So that means that the velocity vector has to be uh, zero in the exterior domain. Okay. So what it tells you is that uh, once you find a uh, stationary solution with finite kinetic energy, then this compact support of the velocity is given for free. Okay. So uh, let me uh, summarize the uh, issues that we have. So first of all, we cannot use the kranz rabinov theorem because we cannot use the lefnov schmidt reduction. That's because we cannot have this one-dimensional kernel space and the image purpose spaces at the linear level. And technically speaking, uh, we can have this one dimensionality, but like between two different regular spaces. Okay. So to fix these issues, uh, basically we are going to use two uh, uh, strategies. So one is that we are going to prove the kranz rabinov theorem without the of schmidt reduction. And to fix this regularity mismatch, we are going to adapt a nash moser scheme. So what we are going to do is that we want to solve a functional equation. Um, the functional depends on the parameter. So we want to put this uh, problem into a Newton's method scheme where the parameter is not necessary. So we want to remove the dependence on the parameter. And once you put the problem into this Newton's method scheme, then uh, the standard nash moser uh, iteration, uh, it works in a very usual way. So. Uh, from now on, uh, instead of talking about this Nash Moser, I would like to focus on this standard of uh, proof. So let's recall some basics about the Nash Moser, um, uh, no, Newton's method. It's just a, one of the most classical way to find uh, a functional equation. So let's suppose we are given a functional G uh, defined between two Hilbert spaces, and we want to find some uh, X star where G becomes zero, okay? And then the typical way uh, is that we first start from your initial guess, and then we evaluate the function, and then we just draw a tangent line, and then you update your guess, and then you just repeat the same procedure, and then you can expect that the solution converges to something which is supposed to be the solution that you're looking for, okay? So more uh, precisely, uh, your next guess uh, can be uh, expressed uh, in terms of your uh, previous guess in this way. So we evaluate the function and then you take the inverse of the linearized operator and then that gives you the distance between like two guesses, right? So <clears throat> uh, the typical Newton's method tells you that uh, if you update your guess, then you're the, the size of your functional uh, it's uh, the the square of your uh, uh, the square of your the previous one. Okay, so here for this mechanism to work out, you need two requirements. So the first one is that your initial guess has to be sufficiently good. So uh, at the at your initial guess, the functional uh, is supposed to have sufficiently small value. And uh, another requirement is the invertibility of your the linearized operator. Simply, we take the inverse of your linearized operator. Of course, if this is not invertible, then uh, you cannot really um, perform this, uh, this, uh, this iteration. So once you have these two conditions guaranteed, then you can easily show that uh, as you approach to the solution, the size of your functional, it 
decays, it goes, it decreases to zero uh, very fast, like double exponentially. Okay. Uh, this is a very elementary uh, the, the iteration, but there is one uh, very interesting relaxation about this, uh, especially about this the second requirement. Uh, so instead of uh, asking for uh, invertibility of the linearized operator, we can use uh, what is called approximate inverse. So approximate inverse is uh, an operator uh, from the image space to the domain space, where when you look at the, uh, the difference, between uh, this uh, composition, this composition and the identity operator, then you have some error. So if you have just zero on the right hand side, then that is exactly the inverse. But you allow uh, the difference to have some like non-zero size error, but its difference can be bounded by the size of your function. Okay. So uh, you can easily see that if you evaluate this operator t at the solution where g becomes zero, then an approximate solution becomes the exact inverse. So uh, <clears throat> with this uh, approximate inverse, you can just perform the this iteration. So basically you replace this inverse of the linearized operator by t, then the, the same uh, argument can uh, just go through. And then you will get the same, uh, the decay rate of the size of the function. It goes to zero very fast, very fast, double exponentially. Okay. So here, <clears throat> the point is to, to perform the Newton's method, you need a sufficiently good initial guess. And you can use, instead of the inverse of the linearized operator, you need an approximate inverse. Okay. So then let's put our problem into this Newton's method. So let's recall that. Uh, our functional depends on one parameter, and the image is the uh, the normal velocity vector, uh, normal velocity uh, on each each boundary. So we are going to assume that we there exists some parameter a, a tilde uh, at which the kernel uh, and the image perp of the linearized operator have one dimensional space, but of course. Uh, they are between like two different regular spaces compared to this nonlinear level. And that's why we are doing all of this extra work. So uh, with this assumption, uh, we are going to define uh, another functional uh, G epsilon. So for small epsilon, so I'll be for that. So we already know that uh, at this point, A tilde N zero, uh, the linearized operator has one dimensional kernel. So we can find, um, non-zero element uh, in this space. So then for small epsilon, we take uh, epsilon size step in the corner space, okay? But of course the problem, the, 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 the functional f is nonlinear. So this doesn't really solve the functional equation. So we have to make corrections. So given r, so we use this one dimensional portion of r. So here's the p, is the projection to this one dimensional space, the kernel of the linearized operator. So given R, we use this one dimensional portion of R to correct the parameter. And then we use this, the rest portion of R to correct the, the functional arguments, okay? Then when you look at G, then G doesn't depend on the parameter anymore. Then now the goal is to, uh, to solve uh, this equation for R or small epsilon. So we are going to do the Newton's method as I mentioned, and then we have to check two requirements. So first of all, uh, we check the initial guess. So when you plug in zero, so just can you imagine the bound, uh, the vorticity whose boundary is just solely determined by this epsilon times V. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, its size uh, is expected to have the size epsilon squared because we take this step in the kernel space. So the first variation vanishes. So then the, the, the first term comes out is just the, the secondary tip. So uh, its size is not just epsilon, but epsilon squared. So it, it seems to be uh, small enough. And then we have to check the, the invertibility of the linearized operator. So this step is more involved, but one can show that the linearized operator of G can be uh, decomposed into two parts. So the one part 
is an isomorphism, so we can really invert. But uh, the other part is something, uh, but uh, it's basically we take the derivative and multiply by the, the radial derivative of the string function on the outer bound. Okay. So the uh, uh, once we have uh, the uh, isomorphic property of this operator A, then the inverse of uh, this operator can be served uh, as uh, the approximate inverse that I mentioned before. Okay. The reason is that the error on uh, this guy uh, is the uh, is the uh, the derivative of the of the the harmonic function on on the boundary, uh, and then the typical Dirichlet Neumann operator uh, estimate shows that the derivative of the harmonic function on the boundary can be uh, bounded by the tangential derivative of the the harmonic function itself. So and and uh, that means when you look at the g and g is simply f, but f is simply the normal velocity, which is the tangential derivative of the string function. So uh, we can uh, indeed, we can uh, bound the, the gradient of the psi by the size of g. So if we can find uh, an element r where g becomes zero, then the inverse of a is actually the inverse of the linearized operator dg. So the inverse of A is uh, good enough to be used as an approximate inverse of the, uh, the problem. Okay. Uh, this is all uh, I would like to talk about today. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Jamin, for the nice talk. Uh, let me ask you if there are questions in the audience. Okay, um, just a small question. If you can go back to the your main theorem at the start. Yeah. Yeah, okay, okay. So uh, I guess in the infinite kinetic energy case, you have way less difficulty because you don't have this degeneracy at the boundary, right? Right, 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 exactly, right. Okay. Uh, Another question is, um, so those are uh, stationary solutions. I, I mean, I, I know I know the construct, I mean, I know a bit about the construction of the V states. Yes, so yes. How, how is it, because um, the, the, uh, the V states are so uh, uh, stationary solutions, uh, is it, uh, I mean, okay. How how would you compare them to to the type of stationary solution that you get here? Uh, so for the V state, I think the 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 feature is very similar to this infinite kinetic energy. So basically, there's no degeneracy. Uh, but uh, oh, okay. the finite kinetic energy case, it's more different. It's different. Okay, I see. Yes. <laughs> okay that's 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 nice um are there any other questions okay so thank you again yeah, thank you very uh, much you're welcome it was our pleasure uh